How long have you actually been making music as a career? Okay, professionally, I would say since I was 18, because that's, that's when I did um, Shanks and Big Four and TNT. I'm 36 now, so I'd say about 18 years. Yeah, yeah. A lot's changed, right? Yes, a lot has changed. A lot has changed. Social media's come into mm -hmm. the forefront. Yeah. Those 18 years ago, what was it like in trying to get your name out as an artist without what people are utilising in terms of social media, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube? How well, did you get yourself there? Well, back in the day when I was, you know, when I kind of first started out, um, it was very hands-on. You had to be out there, do you know what I mean? You had to really, you couldn't just do like a video and people would just see what you're doing. You'd have to go out there and perform live, sing live. Um, you know, the way people would hear about you would be through broadsheets, through TV, through radio. And um, <clears throat> you didn't actually have an instant kind of, you know, segue to your fans. You had to literally go out and get your fans and people had to really see you do your thing, you know. But to be honest with you, back then, it was so much more fun because you really kind of honed your craft by doing that. You got better every time because the more you perform, it's like training, I guess, or anything you do, the more you train, the better you become. So, yeah, it's good though. At that point, what would have been seen as your big break, you know, for 18 years starting in, what did you think, okay, I'm finally really in the game now? Do you know what, I mean, I think, obviously when you think, I started out with Shanks and Bigfoot, which went into number 12 in the national charts, a song that I did. I didn't do Sweet Like Chocolate, everyone. Everyone always asked me, it wasn't that one, it was the other one. <laughs> but I did the whole album with them, except that song. So, um, so in a way, but then it wasn't as Terry Walker, it was me kind of featured on the record. But obviously when I first got my deal, my major deal with um, Mercury Def Jam, that's when I was like, whoa. And then obviously getting nominated for like four MOBOs, Mercury Music, um, the Mercury Music Prize, then all the broadsheets, all the, just, all, the, um, all, the, all the critical acclaim of all the, all the like, reviews were amazing. So like, you know, it was crazy. But at the time I was young and no one had really done what I'd done in England as a black girl as well before, like in the kind of music that I was doing, with like an 11 piece band. So to me, it, just, it was just like, oh, I'm just doing music. I didn't really understand what actually had, had happened. Now I look back, I'm like, damn, girl, you did good. It was good. Were there any, when you signed to a major at that point, Yeah. were you aware of the commercial expectations placed on you? Mm -mm, not at all. Because um, again, when I came in, I was, I was just about the music. So the business side, I'd let, I'd let my management and you know the team deal with. So I wasn't even aware. I just thought, I'm just going to go out on stage and be me and sing. And then after, obviously, the second, when the second album came along, and it was a thing of, we need you to sell records. It's great you being cool and critically acclaimed and it's all nice and everything, but we need you to make, make sell some music now. And that's when obviously things started to shift and change and it was like, you know, well, Jamila's doing well, Beyonce's doing well, we need you to kind of look a little bit like this and maybe make the music that they make, which is obviously where they went wrong with me because I was, that wasn't my audience. So, but you know, you learn and you live and you learn, you know, so. When you get to the whole stage of when you're making music and then yeah. you're now you're now seen as a product who's compared to another product. Mm. Um, mentally, how are you able to like get through that? Because I feel that's quite challenging for an mm. artist when you want to make your own music and it's like, no, make music for the consumers as opposed to for yourself. And see, this is what the problem was. I think for me, if I'd had the right infrastructure around me at the time, I don't think that would have happened. And I think I had, I did ha initially have that, but then certain things kind of went wrong and then I had another set of, uh, it's another team around that didn't really understand me as an artist. They were like, oh my God, she can sing, she's great, you know, she's, she's good looking, blah, blah, blah. we can make this work. But they didn't understand who I was. So for me mentally, it did kind of mess me up because I was like, who am I? Like, what am I doing? And the fact that I even went along with it at first really really brought, my, brought me down because I thought, oh, I stand for something, but I kind of compromised myself and I should have never done that, you know? So no, it's very challenging when someone's basically telling you that you're not, good enough, you need to be like this, which is not who you are, you know, it's weird, it's a weird thing. Can I pick up on the, um, the time, you were in America quite a lot making music. Yeah. Um, what was that experience like in the States making music? Um, for me, being in America making music was like being in a toy store, do you know what I mean? Because obviously all the people that I grew up with listening to from, you know, the Whitney's, the Lauren's, the Brandy Monica's, the Aaliyah's, the Shantae Moore's, they're from that place and it's like, in America, nearly everybody is talented, I'm seriously. When you meet singers out there, like you haven't heard singers until you've heard some like American gospel, like church singers, they sing from another place. So for me to be out there and then to be kind of guided by them and then even them accepting me and understanding that, you know, making me know that I'm good was like, 
the kid in the candy store. It was amazing. I mean, how long were you up there? Oh my god. Um, so obviously, I think my actually how I got my first deal was because I went to LA by myself to just find myself for a minute, and um, that was um, just before I got signed with my first album. So that would say that was about two thousand, two thousand or nineteen ninety nine around that time. So it's been. Yeah, I, I, before I got my major deal and I did the Shanks and Bigfoot thing, um, I, I decided that, you know, people don't get me over here. So I just went to America just for, I was meant to go for a week. I booked like a motel room in some dodgy motel room. I could have got killed, actually. It's quite scary. Um, but I was out there, I was like, damn, I just need to go out and just clear my head. And I met these amazing people out there who then just kind of took me in and I ended up staying out there for a month. And then that's how I recorded three songs of my first album, which was Love For, Ching Ching and Brand New Day, which is what got me my major deal. And um, from there I had um, Def Jam, Magic Johnson's label, Elektra, a few people like, that were like really wanted to sign me, but then 9-11 happened. Well, Magic Johnson was busted. Yeah, yeah, because he had a label. Yeah, Johnson, Johnson had a label. And um, well, I think he still has a label now, actually. Um, but um, yeah, so then I came back to England because and then 9-11 happened and I was meant to fly back to New York because I was meant to get signed to Def Jam in, in the States but 9-11 happened and we couldn't fly back obviously because you know and um, but they were like yo we've got someone here in London that we've just sent over and you know please go and talk to him and he, I think it would be great for you to have a home here and then I met, went to meet him and he was like yo I can't believe y'all went all the way to the States I've been here this whole time man y'all need to talk to me and I'm like hey but the funny thing is I was actually meant to get signed to um, Ireland in um, Ireland and Ireland, I think now, when I think about it, which is kind of still Def Jam Ireland anyway, but Ireland and Def Jam UK was with Mercury at the time. So, and Ireland offered me more money, but because I was so excited by Def Jam, like, it's Def Jam, oh my God, and all these amazing artists, I have to go to Def Jam. But uh, I wish in hindsight now that I'd went with Ireland because Ireland, they take time with their artists. They, they give you time to grow. They don't just, after the first project, it doesn't work. Tell you to switch it up. They're like, okay, we know you've got something here, but we're going to work with you. And you know, things happen. How important is a team and how do you actually go about finding the right people <sighs> to work with you? Because I think that's a lot of the times where you're the talent mm -hmm. and you need the right, like you said before, the right infrastructure. Yeah. So how do you go about it or what are you looking for when you're picking people to be a part of your team? See, this is, this, this is what's interesting. It's like back then when I was just wanting to sing and I didn't really know, I, kinda, I needed someone to kind of guide me. But now, because I know what I'm doing and I know who I want to be, the, way best, the best thing to do is find out with yourself first, what do you want to do? What, what, is, what kind of career do you want? Do you want to be an artist that people write songs for you and you're manufactured and there's in it? Or do you want to be an artist that stands on their own and kind of has a message and you know, it might take longer for you to get there? Because obviously what I do, so for me to find my team, I have to find people that, first of all, understand me as an artist. First of all, understand what my messages are, understand my strengths and understand my weaknesses and are honest. They don't have to, um, don't have, there's no point in me having people around me that are telling me yes to everything and they, and they don't really agree necessarily because that means they're not going to give their all. You need people that want to go out of their way to make sure that we're going to make this happen, do you know what I mean? And that might understand that it might not happen overnight and that there might be times when we have to work extra hard to get to this point. So really and truly, sometimes it's not even someone that has necessarily the biggest skill, it's about someone that has the biggest faith and vision in what you're trying to do and knowing that you're going to grow together. And that's what I've found so far. It's like I've had a lot of people that have been so amazing and helped me out, but I understand that they have a life too and they've got other things to do, so they can't sacrifice the way this is my life, you know. So for me, all I do is music. This is how I pay my bills. So even if it's writing for other people or other stuff, this is how I make my money. So anyone that's along for the ride with me has to understand that as well. So, yeah. Can I ask you something else that, you know, when I watch a lot of the things in America, they always talk about... Mm accountants and lawyers sometimes stifling them. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying just in general, this yeah. is where I see it. Um, is that something that you also know to be, you've got to be aware of the type of accountants you have, the type of lawyers you have, and the, basically the type of legal advice? Yeah, advice definitely. I mean, I think to be honest with you, because I, I, I'm very lucky to have a lot of people in, in house, in family that are kind of dealing with stuff. So I'm lucky that I don't have someone that's just only out for the money. Like my accountant is like a family person, but he looks after people like Emmy Sunday. He looks after like some really big people like Slow Patrol, but he's a family orientated businessman. So his thing is about growth and making sure that everyone is building towards the future, not just, ah, oh, she's making money and we're just gonna invest here and then you lose a bunch of stuff. And it's the same with um, your lawyer. You have to be with someone that sees the bigger picture. 
Because they know, as you said, but sometimes you just don't know with anyone. You have to really feel these things out, unfortunately. It's not, you don't always know who's the, who's the good person initially. It, it comes with time and experience and wisdom, obviously. That kind of segues into Feel It In The Water. Feel It In The Water is a song that I, um, I wrote in Sheffield. And I don't know if anyone follows me on my Instagram or anywhere. I talk about Sheffield like it's my first, second, third and fifth home. It's like, I love it so much. Because um, when I'm up there, the people are so friendly. They're so forthcoming. They just want to help you. They just, they just want to make you comfortable. They want you to just be like, anything you need, love, all right, oh, come here. They're just so lovely. And um, I met Andy Nicholson through um, Reverend and the Makers from John, John McClough from Reverend and the Makers when I was to do this thing called Africa Express with um, Damon oh, Auburn. Yeah. yeah, which was amazing. And so already the energy was just all love. It was, it's about the music and the vibes. So when I met Andy, Andy who used to be in Arctic Monkeys initially, and um, who's now paired up with Jamie Shield and they've become Sticky Blood. When we made the music together, his, his story is obviously crazy because when he was in Arctic Monkeys and his situation left, so he's gone through stuff, I've gone through stuff. So when we make music together, we make music because we want to make music that is real and that people can relate to and that hopefully we can help you get through some stuff that, you know, you might have found hard. So when I wrote that song, it just came to me. I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh my God, the way I feel right now, I feel like I'm finally home and I'm with people that just get what I'm trying to do. I feel it. And then it just made me realise like, wow, there's a saying that people say, it must be in the water when someone, you know, when everyone's always really nice and like, it must be in the water, everyone's really lovely or everyone's really talented up here. And everyone in Sheffield is so talented and so humble and so nice. And it just made me feel so welcome. And so I just, I kind of dedicate that song to Sheffield because it made me feel so at peace and just back. I'm just back. <laughs> when, you, when you make that type of song, do, yeah. you know, do you know that it's going to have the same impact to you as it will for other people? Do you know what? The moment I hear it back, or even when I'm writing it, and it makes sense to me, I'm like, yeah, this, this is a good one. And everyone that hears that song, even when I perform it, every time is like, yo, that song means so much to me. And I'm like, crazy, because everyone's gone through something, or they understand that feeling. You know that feeling, when, that feeling when you know you're comfortable within yourself, and you're comfortable with the people around you? That's that moment when you feel it in the water.